Today we are discussing memory, in particular how to improve your memory. When we talk about memory, what we're really talking about is how your immediate experiences relate to previous and future experiences. Today I'm going to make clear how that process occurs. Even if you don't have a background in biology or psychology, I promise to put it into language that anyone can access and understand. And we are going to talk about the science that points to specific tools for enhancing learning and memory. با سابسکرایب کردن ما میتونید رایگان ازمون حمایت کنید که انگیزه بشه برای ادامه دادنمون. Now memory is simply a bias in which perceptions will be replayed again in the future. Anytime you experience something, that is the consequence of specific chains of neurons that we call neural circuits being activated. And memory is simply a bias in the likelihood that that specific chain of neurons will be activated again. So for instance, if you can remember your name, and I certainly hope that you can, well, that means that there are specific chains of neurons in your brain that represent your name. And when those neurons connect with one another and communicate electrically with one another in a particular sequence, you remember your name. Were that particular chain of neurons to be disrupted, you would not be able to remember your name. So let's talk about tools for enhancing memory. Now there's one tool that is absolutely clear works and it's always worked. It works now and it will work forever. And that's repetition. The more often that you perform something or that you recite something, the more likely you are to remember it in the future. And while that might seem obvious, it's worth thinking about what's happening when you repeat something. But when I say what's happening, I mean at the neural level. What's happening is that you are encouraging the firing of particular chains of neurons over and over and over again. And with more repetitions, you get more strengthening of those nerve connections. Repetition works, but the problem for most people is that they either don't have the patience They don't have the time, and sometimes they literally don't have the time because they've got a deadline on something that they're trying to remember and learn, or they simply would like to be able to remember things better in general, remember them more quickly. This process of accelerating repetition-based learning so that your learning curve doesn't go from having to perform something a thousand times, no repetitions, right? You can just perform that thing the first time and every time. And as I'm going to tell you next, there are particular neurochemicals that you can leverage in order to learn specific information faster and to remember it for a much longer period of time, maybe even forever. And you can do that by leveraging the relationship in your nervous system between your brain and your body and your body back to your brain. And what they found is that if one evokes the release of adrenaline, through this arm into ice water approach, the information that they read previously, just a few minutes before, was remembered, it was retained as well. This had to be the effect of adrenaline released into the brain and body, because if they blocked the release or the function of adrenaline in the brain and or body, they could block this effect. The important thing to keep in mind is that it is the emotionality evoked by an experience that dictates whether or not you will learn it quickly or not. This is absolutely important in terms of thinking about tools to improve your memory. And no, I am not going to suggest that every time you want to learn something, you plunge your arm into ice water. Why won't I suggest that? Well, it will induce the release of adrenaline, but there are better ways to get that adrenaline release. You could take a cold shower. You could do an ice bath or get into a, a cold circulating bath. We've done several episodes on the utility of cold for health and that describe how best to use the cold shower or the ice bath or the circulating cold bath in order to evoke epinephrine and dopamine release. The point is that the time in which you would want to do those protocols is after, ideally immediately after your learning bout, meaning when you're sitting down to learn new information or after trying to learn some new physical skill. 
in appearing on other podcasts, I've talked a lot about things like non-sleep deep rest and naps and sleep as vital to the learning process. And I want to emphasize that none of that information has changed, right? I don't look at any of that information differently as the consequence of what I'm talking about today. It is still true that the strengthening of connections in the brain, the literal neuroplasticity, the changing of the circuits occurs during deep sleep and non-sleep deep rest. Brief naps of about 20 to up to 90 minutes some in some period of time after an attempt to learn can enhance the rate of learning and memory. However, those bouts of sleep, the deep sleep that night, I should say, or those brief naps, or even the so-called NSDR, as we call it, non-sleep deep rest that was used to enhance the learning and memory, that still can be performed, but it can be performed some hours later, even an hour later. It can be performed two hours later, four hours later. Remember, it's in these naps and in deep sleep that the actual reconfiguration of the neural circuits occurs, the strengthening of those neural circuits occurs. It is not the case that you need to finish a bout of learning and drop immediately into a nap or sleep. Some people might do that, but if you're really trying to optimize and enhance and improve your memory, still try and get excellent sleep. Again, fundamentally important for mental health, physical health, and performance. And we can now extend from performance to saying including learning and memory. Nap, if it doesn't interrupt your nighttime sleep, naps of anywhere from 10 to 90 minutes or non-sleep deep rest protocols will enhance learning and memory. We can now add to that that spiking adrenaline, provided it can be done in a safe way, is going to reduce the number of repetitions required to learn, and that should be done at the very tail end or immediately after a learning bout which is compatible with all the other protocols that I mentioned. And the reason I'm revisiting the stuff about sleep and non-sleep deep rest is I think that some people got the impression that they need to do that immediately after learning. And today I'm saying to the contrary, immediately after learning, you need to go into a heightened state of emotionality and alertness. Now, I certainly don't want to give the message that just moving, just exercise is sufficient to keep the neural architecture of your brain healthy, young, and able to learn. While that might be true, it's also important to actually engage in attempts to learn new material, either physical material, so new types of movements and skills, and or new types of cognitive information, languages, mathematics, history, uh, current events, uh, all sorts of things. Nonetheless, it's clear that physical movement and cognitive ability and the potential to enhance cognitive ability are intimately connected, given the information about spiking adrenaline late or after a period of attempt to learn, you might be asking, when is the best time to exercise? Now, unfortunately, that has not been addressed in a lot of varying detail where every sort of variation on the theme has been carried out. And yet, Wendy Suzuki's lab has done really beautiful experiments where they have people exercise. Generally, it was in the morning, but at other periods of the day as well. And what they find is that at least as late as two hours after that exercise, there's an enhancement in learning and memory. Now, I want to be clear, we don't know whether or not that exercise led to big increases in adrenaline. It may be that those forms of exercise were modest enough or didn't challenge people enough that they merely got a lot of blood flow going and that the improvements in learning and memory were related to blood flow and we presume increases in osteocalcin. However, you could imagine a couple of different logical protocols based on what we've talked about. Let's say you were going to do a form of exercise that was going to spike adrenaline a lot. So this would be exercise that really challenges your system and forces you to kind of push through a burn, right? So here I'm mainly thinking about cardiovascular exercise, but it could be, uh, it could even be yoga. It could be resistance training. If it's going to give you a big spike in adrenaline, it's going to take some serious effort then logically speaking, you would want to place that after a learning bout in order to increase learning and memory. 